Uh, yes, so I, I founded Autodeck Records in 2012 uh, when I was looking for a record label for myself and my wife, and my uh, uh, then uh, uh, fidanzata, uh, now my wife. And uh, I wasn't really convinced with the options that were available to me at the time and uh, decided that uh, perhaps I could do it myself. And uh, but in the process of doing it myself, I thought, what should a record label be like today in, uh, in today's um, music world? Uh, because it's no longer the case that you've got big uh, majors who are willing, generally speaking, to invest in the career of a young unknown artist and test to see whether they actually make it and uh, sustain them for decades uh, as, they, as they progress. Um, it's um, usually speaking, young artists nowadays have to finance their own recordings. And at that point, it's when the artists themselves are the ones financing their own recordings and giving their, their name, their image, their music, their talent, and their money uh, to a label. My question was, well, what role does the label really play today in today's uh, music uh, business world? And obviously it does play some roles. Uh, labels are very efficient at doing sort of things, at making albums, at uh, networking uh, with the right people in order that they get marketed correctly. There's the right press uh, and uh, they have a distribution network and, uh, and they know how to put, put albums together and they've got the right connections with studios and stuff like this. So I'm not to say labels are not relevant anymore. They, they certainly are. But my question is what, um, what uh, role really uh, should the label play uh, for artists today? And uh, my answer to that was that it should become as uh, transparent, as horizontal, as flat into the structure as possible. So that it becomes a mechanism uh, on behalf of the artists that uh, becomes a channel for the artists to, to reach their, their audiences and to, to create their projects. But um, it's no longer the uh, necessary to have the, the typical uh, artist repertoire manager, the CEO who knows everything and who uh, is going to, to say, this guy's got talent, this person doesn't, and I'm gonna make your career and, and not yours. You know, uh, My feeling was that model is past because in any case, the labels aren't actually making your career. You're sort of making the labels career by, by contributing your, your project, right? So, uh, so my answer to doing this was uh, to, first of all, uh, make a label. And it, we made a label and it, and it functions very well. Uh, we have distribution all the world and uh, we make um, around 30 CDs per, per year anymore. And uh, so that part, yes. But the, uh, the, the thing which sets our label apart from, from all the others, um, all the others I say, because I don't know of any yet who've uh, emulated our model, is that um, I don't decide who joins our label. That's done by the artists on the on the roster themselves. So uh, an artist who wants to record with us, they send a demo recording, and much in the same way as a scientific peer-reviewed journal uh, would process an incoming submission to be published in a journal, we have an anonymous uh, blind peer review uh, system. It's one of the it's the first uh, digital platform which we built, uh, which is actually open access; anybody can use it. And uh, it allows us to, we set up our roster inside as jury members. Incoming submissions go through this system. And uh, as soon as a new demo is received, it's sent out an email to an automatically randomly selected subgroup of the roster, because now we're for hundreds of people in the roster, but uh, 33 of them get each incoming demo and then vote. And uh, the majority decides and the majority says, yes, the system tells us who the applicant was and we make this, the album, of course. If the uh, result is negative, the system uh, deletes the name and even I don't know, nobody knows who the person was. So we don't make anybody embarrassed. That's not the point. But um, the benefit of this is that it's the same filter for everyone. And we don't know if the person is a man or a woman, if they're famous, if they're not, if they're rich, if they're poor, if they're ugly, if they're beautiful. Uh, we just listen to their music and decide on the basis of the quality of the interpretation, the interest of the program. And it's a model which uh, has worked uh, very well for a lot of our artists. And um, it, uh, for, for many years, I, I haven't controlled recently, but we had equal numbers of men and women, for example, on the, on the roster. We have people from many, many countries. I don't know anymore, probably 40 different countries or something. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, um, it was really the, the idea behind the label, which I think resonated with a lot of artists and which I think is, is really responsible insofar as we're a successful label. I think the, the idea behind it is, is a large, a big reason for that um, because we have um, 
there are a lot of artists who sympathize with this, uh, this way of looking at, uh, at things. So we, it was classical music only for the first few years. Uh, the fact is uh, our distribution chain, our studio and uh, the, the, the networks which we had essentially were uh, equally good for, for jazz and for world music. So eventually we opened the jazz and then finally we opened the world music. So now we do essentially all the acoustic genres. Uh, once you start talking about doing other genres of music, uh, you really need a different distribution network. And uh, honestly, you need expertise, which is not my own. Uh, but uh, so far we have, uh, we're, we're still mostly classical, but we have some really notable, really nice jazz albums and some, some really interesting world albums as well. In general, um, we, when we make an album, uh, we make it first of all for uh, for the artist, for posterity, for uh, the the for us, an album is not just a, a commercial product. Uh, in fact, we're, we're also nonprofit. We we choose our artists uh, not knowing who they are. Uh, we, we we choose solely on the basis of the the importance of of doing that project, and what that means is actually. A lot of the time, something like uh, Chopin Nocturnes, which might be a really commercially successful album, uh, we don't accept because we're all tired of it. All, all of the other artists, we're like, yeah, we've, we've listened to that a thousand times. Do we really need another one? Probably not. I mean, maybe it's really, really good, in which case we say, okay. But uh, but most of the time, we, uh, we, we tend to favor uh, more in innovative programming. And I, I, it's not a policy to label, but... Two thirds of the, of the albums which we produce are 20th century, 21st century uh, in classical. And uh, obviously that, that, that shows you something. That shows that we as musicians, we, we realize that the market is saturated already with uh, all the standard fare, you know. And we as, as peers evaluating each other, we, we, we enjoy encouraging each other to do these, these more innovative things, even if they're maybe not as successful in the market. Um, and so, uh, so our catalog is, is very uh, rich in, let's say, niche uh, material. Um, that's, like I say, I didn't control that. I didn't impose that from, from above. That just was sort of a natural uh, thing of, that uh, came organically out of this democratic system. Um, but uh, one of the benefits of that is that there is an audience. It's a small audience. There's also less offer. And so you, uh, if, if you build fans uh, in, in, in these niches, uh, they're likely to, to follow you and follow you from release to release. The other benefit to the system is that we do have some uh, famous, I, I can say really famous artists who have, uh, since we started joined the label, uh, which is really cool. Um, but we also have tons of artists who are like debut and doing their first albums. And uh, the risk of course is releasing your first album uh, today. Uh, is it going to get reviewed? Are people going to pay attention to it? Uh, if you don't have tens of thousands of years to market it, how are you going to make uh, people pay attention to it? And one of the benefits of the system is that uh, the critics know, and to a certain extent, I think our public knows that uh, the filter that we apply is the same for everybody. And so if they know uh, Michele Campanella or Arto Pizarro or the Bamberg uh, Symphony Orchestra, or I don't know, uh, uh, some of these big names, um, they, uh, they realize that the same filter has been applied across every single project. And so we don't publish vanity projects. We don't publish just because somebody's got the money to pay us to publish something and, and, and say that it's good. We, we choose very carefully which projects that we do. And that curation is valuable to the public. And so they, they, they appreciate that and they follow us. Uh, the same with the reviewers, the reviewers, uh, we get, we, I'd say punch above our weight, if you, if you know that expression, we, uh, we, we manage to, to do more than you would expect for the, the size of label that we are. So uh, I don't, I mean, mostly I know my sales figures, you know, and that's not uh, maybe the, the most intimate way of knowing your audience. Um, and for like, if you're an orchestra or uh, um, I, I'm sure that you, you have much more sense of, of who your audience is. Um, we, uh, the, the, the major markets for us are the United States, uh, UK, Germany, and, uh, and Japan, and then France, I think. Um, and um, I would assume that just like everybody's uh, audiences, it tends to be tilted more towards uh, older gentlemen. Uh, this is a very strange fact, but uh, people who buy CDs tend to be men. 
I don't know why that is. Uh, I, I don't know what, why women are not interested in buying CDs. Uh, that might be different with streaming. I don't know. Uh, I've never seen statistics on that. But apparently, uh, the, the, the typical person who buys the most CDs is a fairly well-to-do uh, middle-aged to older gentleman. And uh, so I would assume that's our audience. But, but unfortunately, I don't really have any way of, of knowing granularly Um, this is, I'm, I'm, I imagine, is a question related to these for past two years of the COVID uh, lockdown, meltdown, finance. Okay, um, so in a certain sense, as well, we're a little bit more insulated from from this than an orchestra or a venue, or um, because uh, in any case, people can still buy our, our albums and they can still stream our albums, and, and uh, streaming is maybe actually more popular now than it was uh, before. Um, so, so that's um, not. A, a, the, the thing which, which actually changed, which, which was very difficult, is that uh, artists were not able to come and make their albums with us. Um, somehow, we actually published more or less the same number of, of albums during the lockdown than, than we usually did. But most of them were projects which were already in course before the lockdowns, or albums which artists had recorded elsewhere and were sitting on, and then they had the time suddenly to release them. And so, so we kept uh, relatively busy, but, um, but the studio, my studio was closed. Uh, we went from doing five, five albums a month to five in a year, practically. And uh, some of my, my staff was kind of out of work, you know. And uh, so there were a couple of things. One, one benefit that we, we have, I should say, uh, you asked how we worked before. We, were, we are, have always been a remote company. Uh, the the team that, that works for the label is in UK, France, Spain, Italy, um, in Germany, and 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 Greece in Thessaloniki. And, okay. Uh, so we've always worked uh, remotely since the very beginning, and uh, so we were. <laughs> it, it was not at all difficult to to figure out how to keep going in this sense because uh, we we were completely used to that. Um, but, uh, but the studio, yeah, the studio was, was shut down and, uh, what the, the, the difficulty of course, was knowing that we, we were going to have fewer albums coming into the studio meant that a certain percentage of my, my staff was essentially going to be, uh, unoccupied for, uh, a certain amount of time, which was, which was not good. The, it was in a certain sense fortunate that I, uh, a year or two before, uh, about two years before, had started another recording project uh, in France. Uh, and it's the, the biggest recording project in the history of the world. It is the, uh, recording the complete Gregorian chant. And what that means is uh, 10,000, uh, no, about 100,000 different uh, pieces, uh, 7,000 7, uh, yeah, 7, hours of, of music, um, so, I mean, it would be a closet full of CDs if we put them on CDs. And it's incredible that Gregorian, you don't realize that there is so much repertoire from the medieval times, but there is. And uh, nobody's ever recorded a lot of this music. And so we're, we're, we installed microphones in a church and uh, in an abbey. And the sisters go in every morning at 5 a.m. and they start their day. And then they, they sing about six, seven, eight hours per day of music. Which and we record it all. We we get it. We cut it into pieces. We label what it is and makes a master it. And and then uh, we we publish it in an app. And so we're like the Spotify for Gregorian now. We we, we have an app called Nooms where you can listen to the, the entire liturgy, and uh, we present it with the score and the and the Latin text and the translated text, so that uh, it's it's a lot easier to appreciate and understand what's going on. Um, this project is a three-year recording project. It, it, we record every single day, including Sundays, including holidays, obviously, uh, for three years because the liturgy goes on a three-year cycle. To, so to get it all, it, it takes that much. And um, we started in 2019. Um, and so obviously by 2020, we were only three, uh, nine months into the recording process. I wasn't anticipating publishing this project until we were done recording. In 2022, so next year. Um, but um, we, March 2020, I flew back from the United States. Uh, it was, uh, it was, I was here in Italy. I was like, got managed to get the last flight out of the United States before the lockdowns hit. And I, I, I started to read about what was what was actually happening, and it, it had 
occurred to me that uh, the studio was was going to be closed for an indefinite period, and that uh, this was actually going to be a really big deal, and that it was time to pivot. And uh, so we had a meeting with the team, and we said, uh, so we're still going to make the CDs that, that we have coming in, but the new priority is we're going to publish this project not in 2022, but now. And so in about a week, we made a website. Uh, this is just before Easter. Uh, so just before, uh, what do you call it, uh, Holy Week, the, the um, uh, Palm Sunday, we, we managed to put up a website, which is just a temporary thing where you can listen just to that week's uh, music. And we got huge press uh, because uh, it was the right project for the right time. Uh, people were unable to and uh, they wanted a sense of, of community. And in a certain sense, the model of sisters who live in, a clo in the cloister uh, on lockdown always, <laughs> it's kind of a, a nice, uh, and it gives you hope that, that we can do this, you know, that there, there's, there's somebody who can teach us how, to, how this is to be done in a, in a fun way. And so, so we, we published this project and then uh, at, for Pentecost, just, uh, just 50 days later, of course, we, we had the web app, uh, uh, published, which was a big rush, a big uh, crush to get that done. And then for Advent, which was uh, November last year, November 28th last year, we published the mobile apps. And uh, so that project, uh, in a certain sense, it, it was a huge uh, panic to, to get everything done in, in that short amount of time, but it was the right moment to do it. And I'll tell you, uh, it, I've been doing the label for 10 years now. The next May will be the 10th year anniversary. And in terms of the numbers of, of uh, streams that we have and YouTube followers and Facebook followers, all these things, uh, I'm used to a certain fairly modest uh, growth. This thing shot up uh, is because of all the media attention that it got. And it, it was the right project for the right time. And um, so we got uh, tens of thousands of users, uh, which is which is really cool. And uh, so that we weren't sitting on our hands. We weren't bored. <laughs> we kept really busy, and uh, and we made an entirely new audience uh, in in this process. So it's not exactly a, a solution for other people facing the same similar problems, but. Um, I guess in a certain sense, I can say that it's useful to be uh, flexible in the sense of ready to pivot when it's necessary and um, to be poised in so much as is possible to seize the opportunities as they come. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I have to say yes, because um, I, I'm, I'm certain that it, 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 if, the, the reason why is that I, I know so many people who work in this sector and they all love music and they're going to do what's necessary to keep it alive. And so, um, so it, it will survive. Um, obviously, it's been a huge crisis and many, many people suffered terribly uh, during this period. And uh, it's po possible, very likely, that uh, the classical music business world will be different on the other end of it. I think there were some certain things which uh, were happening anyway, which will happen faster now because of the crisis. So one thing that, that I've noticed personally with the label is that physical sales <laughs> are not, ex I mean, they, they, was, they were never huge, but now they're really, really low. And Partially, I think that's because people couldn't get out of their house to get to the shop to buy them, you know. And uh, so, uh, moving to adopting uh, streaming technology, I think is uh, is is being a lot hastened by this. Um, the other thing which um, I've noticed, I, I don't know if you, if if anyone followed the uh, the Chopin competition this year. They, they did a really good job, the piece of piano competition, uh, and they did a really, really good job of streaming all of their content. And I think they've done this also in the past, but this year there were, it became the topic of conversation among all pianists anyway, uh, because we're, we're suddenly now used to is consuming this content online and streaming. And um, one of the things which I've, we've been noticing, uh, is, I mean, I'm not an orchestra manager, but uh, many, many orchestras were 
confronted with an existential crisis, you know, because if you don't have an audience, uh, what are you doing? Uh, what, what can you do? And so obviously, or some orchestras already had uh, streaming technology and stream their, their concerts and digital archives and stuff like this, but uh, that the, the increase in, uh, in, in streaming con uh, concerts by orchestras has just been huge in the past year. And uh, that's another thing which we are working on. We are uh, building something called uh, Symphonio, which is a, it, well, it will be essentially WordPress for uh, applications if you're a cultural institution. So WordPress in the same sense that you, you easily with a WordPress, you can create a website uh, at low cost and, and uh, use it for your marketing and stream your content, all these things. We're doing the same thing, but with native apps. So. Uh, a cultural client can a customer can can sign up and for a low subscription fee can uh, have access to uh, every, all the tools necessary to launch and maintain their application in the app stores and google and and, uh, and uh, ios um, and what this will allow them to do is uh, connect directly with their audience uh, without intermediaries without having to rely on other people's infrastructure um, and because what, one of the things which I think people realize was that when you're caught unaware, when, when people can't physically get to your, your venue anymore, you need another uh, way of, of contacting and of maintaining a communications channel with your, with your audience. And um, I mean, obviously there are mailing lists and all these things, but it's, it's another thing when you can send out a push notification to the device, which is one of the most intimate devices that the person has. They've always got in their hand, always looking at it, always engaging with it. Um, and uh, you can say, unfortunately, this concert has to be postponed because there was an outbreak of COVID or whatever. And you can say that last minute and notify everybody in time. Uh, and you can offer the, 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 the live stream uh, in real time in its place. And uh, you can sell tickets to that. So anyway, this is, um, again, this is something which we've been thinking about for a while. Uh, this, this type of technology, but uh, it was a question of, of seizing, seizing the moment because this is, uh, this is what orchestras suddenly realize they need. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, a terrible natural disaster. It's kind of like asking what lessons can you, can you draw from a hurricane smashing your house? I mean, uh, it's, uh, it, it, I guess, in a certain sense, uh, one of the things which I guess we can appreciate from it is that when concerts did reopen, and in my studio we have a concert series, uh, the, the artists who come to record, they, they also perform for a local public. And it was just last month that we had our first concert after 22 months. Uh, and it was a really emotional experience to have live music again with people. Uh, and that's, I think, something which um, it's, it's not going to fix things, but, but it, it is sort, sort of beautiful that we can really appreciate um, being together in a, a, a physical space, uh, enjoying, you know, music all, all together. Uh, that I think is something which uh, for a while now, uh, people will be feeling. Uh, we won't be taking it so much for granted. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that uh, the business needs to become uh, more efficient, more lean, um, and more flexible, uh, have digital strategies uh, ready. And, and uh, I think going forward, uh, going forward, they will. And God forbid there's another disaster of this sort that, that actually necessitates them. But uh, I think the, the types of, of uh, problems that, that we've been facing in the past two years have made us think critically about the way we're doing things. We've learned lessons from them and we will do things differently going forward and there will be uh, benefits to that, uh, not counting uh, hopefully another pandemic. Uh, uh, but for example, um, move, the movement to digital, for example, uh, eventually uh, maybe we'll stop printing these uh, the program notes. Uh, because uh, a huge amount of budget is uh, is spent on 
this paper, which is then disposed of and it's not ecological, it's, it's not good. Um, I know also orchestras, big managers, just prepared, makes a big point of this. Uh, they're rethinking how much uh, musicians should really be traveling uh, anymore because it's also very uh, not ecological. And uh, so, I mean, perhaps, uh, and I, I, I don't really know if this, this, is, this is maybe too hopeful, but uh, coming out of this, because uh, we do have a big crisis ahead of us, uh, there's global warming that uh, we all have to confront. And obviously <laughs> the music business is a very small part of that, but we all have to do our parts. And uh, perhaps some of the critical thing that we, we've done during this period, we might be able to apply some of that towards these other problems as well. Um, so if, if you mean uh, like a, a performer um, in terms of, of, of a, somebody wants to actually go on stage, make a, make a living making music, um, my, my advice is that um, it's, it's incredible that you're doing it because it's so difficult and it's so, such a daunting uh, prospect ahead of you. But if you're doing it, uh, it means you have to and you really want to. And uh, so that's, that's great. Um, the thing which I would say is that um, it's very easy to get uh, trapped into um, thinking that you have to do uh, whatever is most popular or, or uh, take as many shortcuts as possible to create as much buzz and things like this. And I think uh, one of the risks is that you don't develop uh, musically to where eventually you're going to have your own artistic identity, which is interesting enough that uh, you'll make it long term. Because it's one thing to, to, to win a, a competition uh, really young, and it's another thing to be uh, an, such an interesting musician that, you know, uh, 10 years after that, you still are giving concerts, giving a career because of the concert, uh, the, the competition. So um, I, would, I would say becoming a musician, and this is, uh, this is true for probably everything, but, but particularly a musician, uh, is you have to enrich your, your soul, you have to enrich your, your whole person. So it's not a question of, of just uh, uh, learning uh, repertoire, learning more repertoire and learning it better and faster. It's a question also of reading, of, of traveling, of exchanging with other people, of uh, learning other languages, of, of uh, uh, networking, of course. And um, so all these things, I think, are equally as important. They, they, they don't substitute, but they're, they're just as important as the conservatory.